video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Okay. All right. Is this, uh, can everybody hear me? Any technical problems before I start? All right. Well, I want to start out my presentation. Uh, I like to jump right in, uh, just get right into the, the thick of things. Uh, this is one of the tools that I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's, this is a part of a god.rb watch configuration file. And uh, I'm going to return to that in a little while. So uh, I work, I'm the co-founder of Other Inbox, which is a, a startup based here in Austin. Uh, and uh, pretty much exactly one year ago, uh, we were running a prototype of our app. Uh, it was a Rails app running on a, a Tiger server that we just happened to have on a, in the office. It was up on a breadboard. Uh, that actually worked pretty well for a long time. We got a couple of dozen early, early beta testers using it, giving us feedback. But obviously, in the long run, that, that, isn't, any, that isn't what we wanted to be running our whole app on. So today, we are running in the cloud. Uh, and this was my, uh, this is how I'm visualizing, uh, th this is how meant to represent the excitement of cloud computing and how distributed and wonderful it is. And we're these super hip developers. We could be on a hay bale working on our app, and it's totally fine. We're not tied to some server room. Um, so, you know, but more, more seriously, uh, we're really able to take advantage of running our app uh, on a cloud platform. We can really think about our infrastructure completely differently. Our servers are disposable. Uh, it's easy for us to experiment. You know, when we do major changes to our database, we can launch two or three different copies of the database and run the migration at the same time. So if it fails on one, if it's something that's long running, we're not totally, totally stuck. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways we can distribute work between our servers. So how do we go from that one server that just, we just happen to have that we could get up and running quickly to, being, to working in the cloud? Well, it took me you know, a few hours to, to get the servers built. Uh, if you're, whatever cloud platform you choose, uh, there's, there's usually a lot of pre-built images that have most of the tools you need. So it really isn't that difficult. For, for us, we use EC2. Uh, there's a ton of uh, images out there that contain most, most of what you need, and then the rest of the time you can customize it to your own needs. So it probably took me a few hours to build the servers. Uh, it only took me like maybe 20, 30 minutes to move the app over. You know, I have a little bit of cognitive dissonance because I'm, I'm you know, about nine months having passed having done it, so I'm, I'm probably being a little optimistic. But I don't remember this part taking much time at all. Moving from one whole ecosystem running on this one machine to a whole ecosystem that is running on n number of machines, you know, that, that scales itself and is very highly distributed. That really only took 30 minutes to get that kind of up and running. The rest of the time, I was working on building new features, you know, taking advantage of being in the cloud, having this flexible environment, um, being able to use disposable servers, being able to spin things up when there's more work to do and shut them down when there isn't. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Why, how, why was it so easy for us to transition to this cloud environment, and what are some of the things available to you to help you take, take advantage of it? I think it dovetails pretty well with the last talk. Um, you know, where I'm going to show you how, uh, maybe at a little bit lower level of detail, not not using gem, not using third party or your own gems, but using some third party tools to help you manage your systems. So, any kind of talk like this, um, there's a, you have to we need to define our terms because cloud computing is now like Web 2.0. It kind of can mean whatever you want depending on what you're trying to sell people. Um, so let's just for the sake of argument for this talk agree. This is what I personally, Mike Sabelsky, mean by uh, cloud computing. All we're, all we're talking about is servers running your code or, that you consume those servers a, as a service. It means you rent them by the hour. You don't own any physical hardware. You don't have a 
you're not responsible for providing power to them. It's just something that you can count on depending on whatever level of service agreement you have with the, the provider. Uh, but it also means that your servers are loosely coupled. You have code running at different places. It's not, you know, you're not necessarily going to know who you're talking to ahead of time. You don't have a whole lot of information about each side of a connection. Uh, it's distributed. So like for us, um, we have essential, the essential parts of our system are not all running in the same place within Amazon's computing cloud. So, but we don't really care exactly where the stuff's running. We just want to make sure there's enough segmentation so that if they have a problem in one place, nothing fails in other inbox, the service keeps running on. Uh, and also, it's a single point of access. So it, wherever in the world our data is stored or the code is running, it doesn't matter to us because we have this, all we have to do is SSH into an IP address and it's there. All we have to do is set up our DNS and the users can find the server. So cloud computing, it's grid-like. If you're more comfortable thinking of it that way, just being this grid of, of servers that all talk to each other. It's utility-like because you buy this stuff by the hour. The cheapest instance we use is like 10 cents an hour. Um, I, you know, I don't know the pricing models that Heroku and Engineard, Engineard use, but it's the same kind of thing where you're, you're not like stuck with this device that you just have to own and maintain. You're buying it by the hour. And uh, you know, the main thing is that it's cloud computing. It means you're, you're cheap, redundant, scalable, and flexible. But maybe a little too flexible. So some of the things that um, you might not have had to deal with when you just were dealing with this one server that you could, if you had to, hard reset or that you could actually you know, connect a monitor and keyboard to and actually get to, you're going to confront some of these issues that I'm, I'm putting up here. Um, I'm not going to, this beyond the scope of my talk to talk about sort of like lessons learned, partly because I actually think I'm still learning the lessons of how to build an app and deploy it in, in a cloud. But what I'm trying to say here is that uh, it's great being able to turn all these servers on and off and have them auto scale and communicate with each other, but that adds a lot of, of complexity. And Ruby can help you with that complexity. And I want to tr share with you how we're using Ruby to help us manage the complexity of, of being in a cloud. So to start with, here's how I was thinking about it. We really use Ruby as the code that glues other Ruby code together. But I feel that that really underestimates, like it, 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 that doesn't really capture it. Because you might as well, you could just use Perl for that. You know? Um, it's, that implies that, well, basically it's just a bunch of scripts that kind of hang together. And it just makes it so we don't have to type in as many keystrokes. But that's not what I'm saying at all. More than that. Um, we really have a Ruby ecosystem where it's Ruby code that's animating Ruby code. The connective tissue of other inbox is Ruby. You know, uh, we're not, uh, but we're not like dogmatic about it. If there's some other better thing that comes along, we'll definitely use it. I'm just telling you, for me, uh, working on this for one year, I, I was only a developer for maybe six or seven months. I was able to get a whole lot done and not spend a lot of time on sysadmin stuff just by, by taking this approach. So I, I do want to throw that in there that like, I hope nobody's in IRC right now saying, oh my god, this guy's a freak. He totally disrespects all their languages. I, I don't mean that at all. Um, I'm just trying to show you some of the benefits that, that we've derived. So what, 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 what am I talking about? What, kind of, what does this mean in a Ruby ecosystem? I mean Ruby code that is scheduling the execution of other Ruby code. This is an example from a gem I'll talk about later called Rufus Scheduler. Ruby code that is monitoring other Ruby code. This is God again, which I'll talk about. Ruby code that kills other Ruby code. This is a, a task from Capistrano. Actually, if you want to get technical, this is a Capistrano task that's calling God.rb. So it's like two layers of Ruby connective tissue. Ruby code that launches your servers. So we right now have a homegrown script that we use to bring up new servers, which I actually wouldn't recommend in the future. That since I wrote this, there's been a lot better solutions. And you know, I'm going. I'm going to show you the, this full thing of code, and it's just kind of one of those scripts that just got longer and longer. So I'm not super proud of this, but I'm putting it out there. You know, I was able to write it really fast, and that's why it didn't take me very long to get us up and running on a new platform. 
Ruby code that configures your servers. So when part of the launch process that we use uh, is we use the DD client to talk to DIN DNS so that when we launch one of these new servers, it's able to get the proper do domain name. Whatever, whatever domain name we want associated with that machine, we can go get it because that's not something you get uh, with, with Amazon. Although you, you can get some static IP addresses, but gen you're always going to need some kind of dynamic DNS if you want to do this at scale at all. So that's, that's what I'm saying. It's Ruby that provides a, a blanket of freedom and security that we as Ruby developers can rise and sleep under. All right. I wasn't sure if anybody was going to get that. I have a greater responsibility than you could possibly fathom. Okay. All right. So why, but why would you do this? Um, if I was in the IRC channel right now, I'd probably be saying like, well, doesn't this guy know about Monit or, you know, Launch D is the bomb or whatever. Um, you know, or some of the, there's probably, I'm sure there's like a hundred things that are even better than what I'm going to show you. Um, why would you want to make everything in your system all Ruby all the time? Well, I think for any one of these cases, you, you could definitely make the case there's probably some better thing out there that's been around longer that, you know, the original Unix developers wrote, and it's awesome. So, like, I'm not saying don't, don't do that, although I'm not really a super fan of Launch D. Um, so, the reason why uh, you would go this way is going back to what I said earlier about complexity. All those different uh, systems, they're all configured a different way. You have to use, you have to think about them differently. They have a different syntax. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. You know, and if, if you're doing cloud computing right, you should, it's not just like the exact same thing that you're getting from your traditional conventional ISP. It means you are taking advantage of the loose coupling and you have one machine, well, you know, some code running one place that's giving tasks, putting them on a queue for some other uh, server to pull off and, and start working on. And you got your storage is all distributed. So uh, th that's, that's part of what adds is the complexity. I alluded to earlier, the, the fact that the servers are disposable means you got to start keeping track of them. Um, you, you know, that it's easy when you have these five boxes you know where they are, you can get your hands on them, you don't have that anymore. Or your ISP could get their hands on them. Now you can just start starting these up. So this is a snippet from the, we use the RightScale's free management tool to kind of to help us with this part of it, which is a Rails app, by the way. Um, so like, look at the names of some of those. They're purpose launched. They only exist to do a test for somebody named Ian. You know, one of them doesn't even have a name yet. Who knows what that is? Let's just say one example of the kinds of complexity you can find with all this newfound power. So Ruby can help you reduce that complexity. That's what I'm here to talk about. So let's talk about some of the reasons. How does that work? Well, first of all, we all know this. I don't think you'd be at this conference if you didn't love Ruby and its expressiveness. So you can just say things more clearly, more powerfully in Ruby than you can uh, and, and some of those other systems. So what's, what's more readable to you? If you were a non-programmer and you had to wade in and try to figure out what was going on, a non-Ruby person, or just, yeah, not, let's say non-developer, non-sysadmin, would you rather read this or that? You know? I can never remember, it's like, I, I seriously can't, I can't tell you, does that mean it's gonna do every five minutes or at five o'clock? I don't know, I, I don't wanna know. I don't have to do that anymore. What was that? 5 a.m. every day. Well, see, look at that. I might have written that wrong, but there's no, there's no doubt what that means. Okay, schedule it every five minutes. There's a whole bunch of ways that you can tell Rufus to what time you want things to happen. I'll show you more examples. All right, so what else? What else is so great about Ruby for these kinds of tasks? Well, this is not something that I had anticipated, but it gives you platform independence. So as long as you have this, all, a lot of these tools you're depending on probably will work. You know, I mean, something like God.rb has native C extensions. You, you, this, it's obviously, this oversimplifies it, but it means that, you know, you're not tied to any one particular implementation of all those tools I showed you before. Now, this pretty much, give or take, is going to run everywhere. It's going to have a better chance of running everywhere than all those individual systems that are all written a little bit differently. Uh, another example of platform independence you don't have to write shell commands. There's stuff in the standard library 
that will save you from having to use back ticks. Now, some of the code I'm going to show you, uh, I, I didn't do that. I kind of I was so busy trying to figure out how to launch things, I just defaulted to my knowledge of shell scripting. But if I had to rewrite it, I would, I would use all file utilities. So then it doesn't matter at all what platform. I can feel really confident that if Ruby compiles there, it's probably going to work. Who, does anybody recognize the syntax in the middle here? This is from a really cool gem called Rush, Ruby Shell. And it, it basically makes, it, it takes a different approach. The, the, the standard library is not very object oriented. You might have noticed Rush gives you, it's like an object oriented wrapper that does all the same things that file and file utils do. So obviously the latter one is more readable, but they're both more readable than having to try to find a shell script that might work in one place and might, might not work another. One thing that Rush does really well uh, is it gives you more powerful globbing and, and file matching, things like that. It, makes, it just makes more sense. Okay, and a, another reason why it's, this is such a great idea and why Ruby has really helped other inbox um, is that this it means you have testable code. You can write tests to figure out if your connective tissue, if this glue that's holding your whole app together actually works. That was something that they alluded to in the, in the last presentation. So this really isn't testable, is it? How do you know that it runs at 5 a.m. I'm sure a lot of people here, how many people have ever fat fingered a cron job before? Yeah, I mean, look at that. It's just, you know, it's, it's great. When you know, I'm sure, I, like I've used cron, I love it, that's fine, but like, you know, I don't, is that supposed to be a star? I, I don't remember, I don't use it anymore. Instead, I use that. And so, you can write a test that proves you're, you're scheduling this the right way. Uh, by the way, I also, I definitely, I feel we've been very much saved by this approach where we put as little as possible in the glue code. Like every rate task we write, every Rufus scheduler job, with a few exceptions, they all just call a method on a class because then you can unit test that class much more easily. It's separated from this scheduling code. And I'm, I'm finding that if I ever am writing something like this, I almost always want to be able to execute it from the console at some arbitrary time of my choosing or just to exercise it. So if you end up, if you start scheduling long lists of tasks in there, it just gets kind of messy, exception handling is more difficult, logging problems, et cetera. All right. So I feel like I could almost give a whole talk on this, but um, less context switching. What do I mean by that? Um, have you ever been working really hard on the JavaScript part of your app, the stuff that runs inside of a browser or um, you know, you have a piece that's Java and you, you get your, your search engine is, is written in Java or what, how, what have you, and then you have to go back to Ruby or you've been doing all Ruby and then you gotta go make a change uh, in the Erlang part of your app and it's like you just, you just feel stupid and all fumbly and you're putting semicolons in the wrong place and your, your variables are camel case when it really doesn't look right, they should all be underscored, whatever. Same thing applies here. Um, if I, I find that uh, it's like especially when I'm doing things with God.rb, which is a, well, actually I don't want to get ahead of my slides here, but I just find that I can stay in Ruby. The longer I can stay in one context, one language environment, the better. So if I'm writing a, a Ruby application that is being monitored, killed, destroyed, launched, what have you, in Ruby, it's so much easier for me to just jump over to that configuration file, change a few things, and get right back into my code. Uh, also, the, if you treat this, some of this glue like it's really part of your application, it's a lot easier to get it under version control. So everything, all the stuff that's critical for our app, all our config files, all, all, a lot of these examples I'm showing you, it's all in subversion. So we can go back in time. All the benefits that come with version control we have. Something else that we're, you know, we're just starting to see is that um, there's a little bit more of a line, an alliance between the people who Op, the network operations folks and the system administrators because we're kind of all speaking the same language. I mean, it, it does require that you find the, the people have some facility with Ruby. That can make your hiring more difficult. Um, but, you know, I would say Ruby's a pretty easy to learn language. It's pretty great. And it's, you know, the whole point of what I'm showing you is you can write this stuff in a way that's easy to understand and read. So it's not that big of a barrier. And what you end up with is Developers who really understand the, the environment 
and people who are in charge of the environment who really understand the code and people can do a little bit of both. And I think there's a lot of benefit to not keeping those people in silos. Like the example he just gave about how he had to give his code to this other system administrator and then walk away. That, that, doesn't see, that, that wouldn't be good for us as a startup trying to be nimble. Um, and just, I also would like to say that you can be very, you just already know that in this language you can be very productive and you can spend you know, more time on features and things like that uh, you can, because you're, of all these other benefits that accrue to you, you could just get more done. You don't have to wrestle with the configuration file all day. Okay. So, how about some, let's, let's get some, some red meat here, some useful tools. Oh, my, my, there we go. All right, sorry about that. So, here's some of the things we want to talk about, not in a, a super lot of detail, but I just want to wet your palate to so get you excited about some of the possibilities out there. All right. So this is my favorite one. That's why I put it first. How many people have heard of God.rb before? Yeah. All right. So this is really great for monitoring processes on your, uh, on your server uh, and taking action. So it's, it has a reporting capability. It can send you an email if something goes wrong. But the real value of it is that if it sees your, your mongrels die or if it sees one of your, your daemons go down, it knows how to restart it. And even better, you can, you can be very fine-grained about it. Like only try to restore this thing five times and then stop so you don't get a flapping condition. So here's what one looks like. Um, this is the, like the canonical example is uh, using God to monitor uh, an application server like Mongrel. Uh, this is a watch condition. And you could see a lot of uh, familiar Ruby help here. Like I'm, I'm using an iterator over a bunch of arrays. So I only have to repeat this configuration block one time for four different mongrel instances. Uh, and I've got this start command there, stop command, restart, uh, and how often, how long do I want to wait? What's my interval before I start monitoring something? So I know it takes about 10 seconds to get everything totally up and running. I'm not going to start checking to see if it's running for 10 seconds. So uh, the syntax can be a little bit hard to understand at first, but the, uh, the, the bottom one here is saying, all right, if this process that you're monitoring is not running, I want you to start it. Um, if, and at the top here, if it starts to use more than this many megs of memory, something's wrong, I want you to restart it. it must be some crazy image magic thing going on there. Um, you know, if your CPU usage goes up, I want you to, to restart it. And here's that, lo that flapping one that I just talked about, the life cycle. So if you start to have problems more than three out of the last five times you check, we're just going to stop monitoring this. We're going to leave it turned off. Uh, and we're going to send out the notification to the warnings alias. So something else that I use a lot that I don't find a lot of people talking about, but I just think is the coolest gem ever, uh, is Rufus Scheduler. So this is an example of how Rufus Scheduler works. Uh, it's from the documentation. It give, I like this because it shows you all the different ways that you can express time. It understands all the different formats that, that you might want to use. You can even you can pass cron to it if you're most comfortable with that. Um, but this is, uh, this is not the method that I recommend because it's harder to test what you're actually doing in, in your scheduler. Instead, like I said, just tell, tell Rufus Scheduler what time you want something to happen or how often you want it to happen and then have, just have it call one of your, one of your tasks. And maybe I, I wrap a little bit of logging around it. All right. So there's a couple of different gems. Like if you happen to be running on, on the Amazon platform, there's a couple of different gems you can use. This is the one that I think works the best. Uh, it's put out by RightScale. I have no affiliation with them. I just think it's a cool gem. Um, and it lets you manage this stuff, your queues, your servers, your storage. It has all the different APIs you need all in one namespace and works pretty well. And it means that most of that stuff I just showed you really boils down to, the, to this. All right, find the queue that has this name. I want you to put a message onto that queue. There's also a get, which takes messages off the queue. You know, and often the pattern is that you are putting a file name into, into your queue, and the file name is something that's in, in uh, your bulk storage in S3. So it's not much more code than that. You can, you, can probably, you can write an app that is sending tasks back and forth to SQS in just a, a few minutes, if you know what you're doing, if you have a gem like this. All right, a lot of pe people, most people know about Capistrano. Um, there's also this alternative called Vlad the Deployer. How many people have heard of Vlad the Deployer? I, I actually kind of like it better. 
Uh, it's a simpler uh, and it uses more native things in your environment because a lot of the things people res wrestle with with Capistrano can uh, boils down to problems with SSH connections and your keys being wrong. And also, Vlad uses the oh, uses Rake, so it doesn't have its own different tasking. So if you already know Rake, you can do Vlad. And it has a really cool uh, logo, which I thought was cool. So I think I'm gonna. You may have like a a, a, rate, a, a Vlad task file or deployment file looks as simple as that. You might not need more than that. That last command is what actually will deploy your app. And you can make it more complicated than that, but that's usually all you need. So that's an example of Vlad. All right, but but also you don't necessarily most of the time or often you're not going to need something else someone else wrote. You're just gonna, you are going to need to write some of that glue code, some of that like. Roll up your sleeves and like, and let's get this done. So, I actually want to show you a, a little bit of that, so we can get out of slide land for a second. Uh, okay. I had this size for a different resolution, but it'll work. Oh, sneak preview there. Sorry, losing control here. Okay, so here's an example of a plain old script. Obviously, you know, if I had to write this again today, I probably I would do it totally differently. One of the problems that I found is that I, I put too much into this script. I'll explain that in a second. So this is launch.rb. Launch.rb is, is a wrapper for the command line tools that Amazon gives you to launch your instances. Uh, it just means that I don't, instead of us having to remember all the time what our, our image ID is, uh, you know, to, to get the instance up and running, um, what image goes with what server. We just have this one wrapper right here that does everything, gives you, you know, complains if you don't tell it the right parameters and things like that. So the whole point of launch.rb though is where we wrap this uh, command line tool and we also make a small zip file that is available to the instance at the time that it launches. And that's called, we call it the payload. The payload has everything needed to uh, configure this server from scratch. So we have this disk image that's very large and hard to change, and that just represents the raw state of one of our servers. But they, we can make that server become whatever we want. So like a couple of the tasks that it takes care of is assigning the host name so that as soon as your server comes alive, it knows what you want to call it. Uh, it knows what domain you want it in because now you can launch a staging environment which looks exactly like your production environment but has a different domain name. You can just have all this taken care of. Plus all other configuration files that you want to have present right at launch time. So we zip it up, we figure out what arguments we want to pass to the command line, uh, and then we launch it. And so that, that's the command right we're doing right here, down here, EC2 run instances, type, what group you want it in. And this, the, the whole point of this exercise is this payload file name down here. That's what contains the stuff to provision the server. So the way it actually works is when you, uh, I'm, I'm sure this is, you get something similar in other cloud platforms, but in Amazon, we, uh, we have these Linux boxes and uh, the, they have RC local files. That, so it's the last script that gets run as the, as the server is being booted. The last thing that happens is RC local runs. RC local looks for that payload file, unzips it, and it looks for a file called autorun.rb, and it just does whatever's in autorun.rb. So the thing that I would change is there's tons of stuff in here that I don't, I don't think really belongs in here. Autorun should just be like the bare minimum needed so that you can communicate with the server. So putting an SSH key on there so that your team can, can get to it, um, you know, giving it a name, stuff like that. Like making whatever changes you need since you built that solid disk image that's the basis of the server. So well, unfortunately, that's, that's what we have. I haven't had time to fix it. But this gives you an idea of how such a system might work. What I would change is that instead of doing this in autorun.rb, I would make a Vlad recipe or a Capistrano recipe that would do this after launch time. So there would be like, okay, there would be this launch script that's very simple, very lightweight, and then there would be a Capistrano task called provision that puts up all the different configuration files and make sure all the packages are present that you need. And then I would have like a separate deploy task that would work just like any other app. All right. 
All right, so done looking at code. All right, there's a couple of other gems that I, you know, I haven't used, but I hear good things about that I would want you to be aware of. So Pool Party is in real active development right now. They don't have any other examples that I could see except this one, but this, I think this is very intriguing. Um, I, I would be very interested to have this kind of power to bring up my servers and provision them. This sounds like a lot better way to go than trying to write my own thing. If, if, I, if I can use something else and continue to work at an even higher and higher level to manage my servers so that I can spend more time getting features out the door, I think that would be great. Uh, I've already talked a little bit about Rush. Uh, not only something I've, exp I've played with, but I think it would really change the way that I deal with the, the operating system. I feel like a lot of the problems that we've wrestled with as our team has gotten bigger and more people have worked that um, just not everyone's familiar with what files should go where. And it, you know, we, this is the part where we could use Ruby's expressiveness a lot more, and I think a tool like, like Rush could do that. There's also a gem called PAL, which has a similar, parts of it are very similar to Rush. But this just looks nice to read. Uh, th I, this is more intention revealing to me. Um, this, is more, this is just more fun than writing a bunch of back ticks. And I think you, well, this will get you, you up and running faster, which is the whole point of doing this. OK, and let's not forget, there's, there's workhorses of the Ruby world that uh, I, you know, when I wish I had taken more advantage of earlier in this process. Uh, there's, there's Rake, which has all kinds of things you need, uh, task dependencies. All, you know, you're, you've, you, most of us have used rake. It can be very helpful for managing complexity. Think about using a rake task before you just write a random one-off script. I think maybe that launch thing I used, that probably should be a rake task also. Uh, and the, the file and file utils give you a, a good abstraction layer on top of the operating system because of that importance of, uh, which helps with the importance of being platform independent like I talked about. Like we're, we're thinking about maybe moving to a different operating system using a different disk image to, to to base our system on. And it, to me, it's like, I don't, I don't even care because I know all, as long as all this stuff compiles and we can test it, you know, if we get a Ruby interpreter and our gems work pretty well, it's gonna be fine. Okay, uh, there's a couple other gems that are specific for um, managing uh, cloud stuff and you, you geared towards EC2. There's the rubber gem, there's the Elastic Rails, there's RubyWorks. I don't know a lot about them, um, but they're, they're definitely things that can help you manage a cloud and you know, they're free unlike some of the other uh, services that you have to pay for. So I would give these a, a serious look if you're considering going this way. Now uh, here's some things that I would like to see that I haven't come across that I've, I've, we don't use Ruby for or we just don't have right now. Um, being able to configure a firewall, like I, I wish there was something like adhesion for firewalls. And maybe you could even use adhesion for that. I wish there was a Ruby health monitoring system and log analysis. I mean, there, there is, I know there are, I'm aware that there are things that will analyze logs, but something that's a little bit more, like that you could, I could monitor my entire cloud's logs in Ruby. And, and backup, that's something else that we have a, a shell script for, and it's just like, I just wanna get it all into Ruby. Okay, um, I've talked already about some of my lessons learned, what I would do differently. Um, I, would, I would use Rush or make heavier use of the standard library. Um, I would write more unit tests for that glue. Now that I've seen how easy it is to write, it's like it's not that much more work to write some tests for it for something that's so important to the functioning of the app. Uh, and I would do as little as possible at that launch time because when there's a prop, when you have to go look at that log file, the console log, it's really hard to debug. Why didn't your uh, auto run script fire? And I feel like I spent too much time on that when I should have been trying to make that as thin as possible. Uh, but it's just me not understanding the, what it was, how often we'd want to be launching these things and changing the purpose of the server midway without having to relaunch it, et cetera. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, we we have, have a little bit of time left. Um, we don't, we have, yeah, we are, we have a firewall on the, on the host that's a, that's stateful, but also in, for, at least for us, Amazon gives you a packet filtering firewall as well. So it's really easy to get something that kind of blocks the low hanging fruit. Like, okay, I don't want to, you can block whole ports out, but if, if you want to protect yourself from a sin flood, those kinds of things on the ports that you do allow in, you, need, you will need to install something yourself. And I, I imagine that's the same for 
all the all the providers. Yeah, so there are there are companies that put a management layer on top of of EC2, or there's just companies like Engine Yard where you can just buy the, the whole thing includes a management layer. I th I think we're getting to the point where we have to do that. We have I would say look, if you get beyond six or seven servers, it just starts to be a little bit. It, it'd be really nice to have some of that. We I feel like we are starting to outgrow some of the. Um, like the, the hand rolled Ruby scripts that I've been using, and like, like the, also some of these companies have pre built components that they you know they can help you configure like a load balancer. So yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely excited to try that out. Uh, do you mean like the, making sure the storage is like retaining what's stored on the server? You can kill them. You could. Yeah, it's easy to terminate them. There's. I showed you the EC2 launch. There's also a, a, a terminate command. I'm sure the other providers work similarly. Oh. So the, the 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 question was, how do you manage DNS when you, you don't necessarily know what the IP address of the server is going to be? So it's two twofold answer. Uh, one, uh, at least for uh, what we use for Amazon, they give you five static addresses now. So you could do a lot with just those five static addresses, uh, and you can easily reassign them to different instances. And then we also use uh, a dynamic DNS company. That, that, so that you know, we the servers can tell the the DNS provider, you know, okay, I, I'm now alpha one, or I'm now male, or whatever whatever we want. So we use uh, there's a that actually is not Ruby. That's DD client is the name of it. But that's just that's like the industry standard apparently. So no reason to reinvent that wheel. Okay, Shoot. Um, I, we've, we're very happy with the cost of it. Um, I, I was not involved in like the, the decision to compare this against other hosting solutions. We mainly picked it because we wanted to be flexible and um, have disposable servers and be able to launch a staging environment and have play around and then shut it off without affecting the production database. So it really wasn't wasn't mainly a cost thing, but it it, it's, it seems. Doesn't seem overly expensive to us. I don't think it's as cheap as some people think it is. I mean, it, it kind of can add up because if you're running the servers 24 hours a day and you need beyond the most minimal basic kind of server, it can get expensive. But I don't think it, I think it's competitive. But I don't. But I'm not. I wasn't involved in that much detail. Yes, yeah, so um, they just added, the, it used to be that you had ephemeral storage, whatever you wrote to a, a disk device you would lose when your server died, and Amazon just added that, and we have started moving some of our servers over to it. It's pretty cool. How, how happy are you with uh, running a production database on EC2? Do you know how issues with the database for the way? So we've been up on it for what, nine months or so. And we've had one just recently. They emailed us to say, "Hey, the server that your instance is running on is not looking good. You might want to move migrate it over." And so we haven't any problems with it. Um, but you definitely one of the things I didn't get into in the talk, but that you have to think about is 
you, you don't have that much confidence in any one server, so you have to build a lot of redundancy in. So like MySQL master-slave relationships um, or clustering. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but that's one of the things you are going to pay for is like, uh, you know what, each, any one instance, they're cheap, but they're also not as reliable as you might like. But, but in nine months, you never have that server go away? No. And we have, um, uh, I mean, we're, other inbox has to do with email, so that's, that's not, a, that, not, not much I can say. So it's very, it has to be super reliable. So we have never had one of our, no, no, well, yeah, we had the mail servers running for like 150 days, and one of them had a problem. But because that's so important, we have two of them. Our DNS is set up so that the other mail, the other server picked up the mail, and absolutely no interruption of service whatsoever. We, it's in a different availability zone, so even if some disaster befalls one zone, we'll, we'll still get your mail. You, no one will ever be the wiser. Were you invited to S3 outages? Um, y yes, we were, but. We built our system is built in a way that um, if any of this stuff isn't available, any of this cloud magic, um, we just build up the, 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 the whatever work. Like if you're making a site that um, does image processing for someone, you should build it in a way that assumes that the queue is not always going to be available. That like you might have to store a batch of work on the local machine. You know, like I guess in that case it would be people upload. A gigantic image file to you, and then you turn around and push it into uh, some kind of large storage cloud like S3, and then you, so another server can pull it off. Well, you should assume that some percentage of the time you're not going to be able to do that right away. And so our stuff is written to be as dumb as possible. So I really, I just have a loop that like looks for any messages that have not been pushed up into the cloud, and if it sees one, it just puts it up there. So that means if there's some kind of I/O error or yeah, if there's an outage. That loop will just keep running, keep trying to do the job until it succeeds. And that's also the way that they, the, taking things off the queue works the same way. So if you take something off of an SQS queue, you can say, if I don't report back to you in 10 minutes, you should assume I didn't do this work. And so then if there's a problem on that end of it, if your server takes a job off the, the queue and, and then it fails, 10 minutes later, it'll be available for another server. So I just feel like, that's just one of the things we've, I've had to really change my thinking about is to not, to not count on the reliability of the servers, but also to, be, that's a little bit freeing in a way. Like you can make things that, that are very loosely coupled. It kind of forces you to do that, and then it hasn't been a problem. I, I believe me, I wouldn't be up there talking so enthusiastically about it if, like, it's definitely made my life easier. Right. Well, uh, this is one of that's one of the things that I can't get into too much detail on that part of our architecture. But there are a lot of like uh, what I would point you to is the the blog that RightScale puts out has really awesome explanations of how to set all of that up and how you can have your slave can be almost exactly up to date with your master. I mean, you know, if if you're going to make a e-commerce site that is you know, banking transactions. You know, this might not might not want to put your database in this environment unless you have you really know what you're doing. Um, but you know, we 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 don't put everything in the database. Would be my answer to it. We keep all we keep a copy of all the critical data in text format at other places. That's just because because of the kinds of problems that we're solving. So I'm not trying to be a jerk, it's just, that's all I can say about it. I mean, people have found a way to make it work and that's, a, that's the resource I would point you to because it's, it's fascinating to me to read about how people have made, are, are making databases work in, in clouds. This is more a comment, but um, you said you wanted health monitoring and pure Ruby. Um, obviously, I'm biased since I work on Scout, but I feel like it does uh, meet at least some of the requirements you're asking for. And um, write small plugins in pure Ruby to report data from the server. And we've recently been working on UPC support so you can clone our existing client with those plugins as your EC2 instance comes up and start checking it immediately. Okay, yeah, Scout. I didn't know that. I, I, I was 100% sure that I was gonna, one of those things I was going to put up. I was really hoping somebody would tell me, oh, didn't you know this awesome thing already exists? So thank you. I will, I'm seriously, I will check that out. That was on my Google queue.
All right, we, we, will, we will check it out. So I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so if you have any other questions, send me an email. I love talking to people and making new connections and, you know, maybe we can go out to lunch or something like that. And I, I do, you know, we're, can't say much about what we do, but we're coming soon. And I will be remiss not to mention that we are, we're an Austin company. Uh, it's a really great environment to work in. Everybody's super cool. It's as cooler than me or cooler. Uh, it's very flexible, but also highly professional. So if you want to, you want to work really hard on something that is really game changing, but not have to go to a lot of boring meetings, like come talk to us. All right. So thank you very much. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.